Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, we'll take a look at Arizona's past with three historians who each offer their own unique perspective on the state's equally colorful history. That's next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. Arizona history includes all kinds of folks from scoundrels, swindlers and outlaws to world famous artists, politicians and innovators. Tonight, a look at Arizona's past with three historians who offer their own unique perspectives. With us tonight, Marshall Trimble, Arizona's official state historian. Bob Osbell, executive editor of True West Magazine and Marshall Shore, who bills himself as an Arizona hip historian. Good to have you all here. Thanks for joining us. Good I'm looking here. forward Thank to this. We've, we, we, we know most of you and we've talked in the past and so we're just going to get right into this. What does Arizona mean to you? Uh, it means open spaces. I love open spaces. People ask me, you said, what, what do you love most about Arizona? And it's always the open space. Um, just a lot of room. 90% of the people live in 2% of the land. Yeah. So that means there's a lot of open space. Bob Bozbell, Arizona. What does it mean to uh, you? Land swindlers, uh, beehive hairdos, <laughs> and uh, price gouging. All right. And that's, that's just from my hometown of Kingston. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, that's, and that's just the top of the list. Yeah. Oh, uh, all right, Mr. Again. Mr. <laughs> Hipstorian, uh, Arizona, what does it mean to you? Um, like a lot of folks that have come here in the past to reinvent themselves. I mean, it's like you've got like Jack Durant. I mean, so all these people moved here and started this whole new life looking for a new way of life. That was, it seems like in the past, that was very much part of Arizona's DNA. Come out here, it reinvent was. yourself, had a lot of creative people, people who weren't afraid to take a risk, mm -hmm. still like that? Yeah, uh, mm -hmm. back then nobody, it was, it was bad manners to ask uh, where, where a person was from or too much about them. And yeah, you could, re you could reinvent yourself. Women uh, found there was more freedom out here. Um, that was, uh, it, was, it was a great place to come, not just Arizona, but the whole West. Yeah, so, yeah. Right. Uh, as far as history now, Bob, uh, what got you going in history? I mean, you, it seems like as, you, as your career has progressed, you become more involved with history, but correct me if I'm wrong. No, no, I have, and I, uh, I want the truth. And of course, that's hard to find in Arizona uh, because there's a lot of smoke screens going on, a lot of corporate uh, d double dealing. And so just like in anything, you want to try to get to the bottom. You want, to, you want to find some truth or find out what actually happened because so much of the history is distorted or uh, misportrayed. And, and uh, I'm the guy that stands up in the theater and says, they didn't have saddles like that in 1873. <laughs> you, guys, you guys do that? Yeah, yeah, yeah I do that too. He's that guy. And as far as uh, getting involved in history now, and you kind of look at it from an off the offbeat angle kind of thing, what got you I going? I do. I mean, so basically, I moved here from New York City as a librarian, worked for the city of Phoenix, and moved into South Phoenix, where I was working. And there was this rich oral tradition that I found there of that community. And you didn't, I didn't really find that elsewhere. In fact, I actually heard people kept saying, there's no history here. And I knew that wasn't true. Every time you'd scratch the surface, you'd find all these really amazing stories of people and things they had done. And people just weren't aware of that. So it really was an opportunity to try and highlight those and connect people to place. Did you, you hear that a lot, that we don't have any history here? We just oh, I'm so tired of hearing that. When I was a young uh, buck working at New Times, uh, people would just say, well, there's no history here, you know. And, and it, it is true. Part of it's true is that uh, if something's uh, 50 years old, people say, well, let's tear that down and build something else. So there is, there is a real sense of uh, when you go to Europe and you see a bridge that was built in the 1400s and they're still using it, it really makes a, a, a zony somebody from here go, wow, they, people actually save stuff? <laughs> so we do, we do have earned that. But to say we don't have any history is absolutely ludicrous. Do you think folks in the rural parts of Arizona uh, adhere to that history a little more than the urban folks? I grew up in a small town, um, smaller than even Kingman, uh, although we called Kingman undeveloped West Ash Fork. But um, I, uh, and I spent a lot of time in small towns today. There are about 163 towns in Arizona and they've all got stories to tell. And I love, I love to hear their stories. Was history always an interest to you? Yeah, I was mostly, when I was a kid, uh, I was mostly interested in World War II because it, 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 it had just ended. And, and I was interested in sports, uh, uh, baseball, uh, sports history. So I was well versed in that and I still love to talk about it. 
Oh, interesting. Uh, Bob, Arizona history, does it feel different than other parts of the country? Well, we have a unique, rich history. This was the collision of three cultures that were, uh, uh, one is the Native Americans, which were the toughest on the planet, and they still are, basically. <laughs> and then you have the Spanish coming up from the south, and then you have all these Anglos coming in from the north, and they collided here in such a dramatic way. And I think that's unique to uh, this area more so than, than other areas. Do you think that that collision is still reverberating? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It still is. Same, same stories, just, uh, you know, you just change the names and, and it's the, the same history. I wanted to go back, though, to uh, uh, rural versus yes, urban on, in history. Please. And I don't think there is a difference. I, I think that, uh, I think it's the 80-20 rule is that 80% of the people don't care and, uh, in the city or, or in rural. They don't care. And then of the 20, you have 10 who think they know everything, and then the other 10 who really do but don't say anything. That's, that's, my, <laughs> I don't, that's my experience. Well, I mean, that's part of it. It's like everyone's got their own side of the story. Yeah. I mean, it's like, like with the Winnie Ruth Judd thing. It's like, it's like I keep hearing then all these people like, oh, well, you know, my, my aunt worked with her at the state mental hospital and, and knew this and said this. And then you meet with a woman who's in her 90s that Winnie Ruth Judd's parents actually stayed with her when they were here. And so there's all this all the most mythos around and stories around a story that you know, but then there's all these other layers about it. Do you, do you, do you get that too? Do you get, have you heard the same story told in a, a few different ways? Oh yeah, yeah, quite often, especially something like the Pleasant Valley War. What is a Pleasant uh, Valley War? Uh, this was the graham Tewksbury feud uh, in the 1880s and early 1890s up in uh, the area around Young. Um, Let's see, that would be just below the Mogollon Rim, um, east of Payson. There you go. And it was a pretty, it was a pretty famous, it, it was probably the deadliest, bloodiest feud in, in American history. In, well, how come more folks don't know about it then? Uh, that's a good question. Um, uh, first of all, the feudists uh, live, by the, uh, uh, live by the rule of, of, of they don't talk. <laughs> yeah. And so they didn't get the story. There's a tight-lipped... Uh, a thing about uh, a feudist, and neither side would really t uh, say much about it. So, it's um, it's not as well known, and that's one of the reasons. Well, the other reason is that it's the Hatfields and McCoys with worse teeth. I think that that's. <laughs> that's I'm just I'm just yanking yeah. your chain. I don't, I don't know if that's true. <laughs> well, I, again, and Bob, you uh, you're such a, an aficionado of Tombstone, of the Earps, the OK Corral, and you have seen that story told how many different ways? Oh, you can tell that uh, story till the cows come home and you'll never get to the, to the real, probably, version. Uh, but even in town there, I, one time I uh, went into a Circle K and it was about five historians and they were all, uh, Casey Tiffertill were there, that guy, Marshall Trimble was there. Uh, there was all these, uh, the Gary, Mar uh, Gary Roberts was there. There was some really big dogs there. Yeah. And the woman says, uh, well, if you, you want to know how the cowboys got in town? They rode the train in. Well, we're standing there and we're going, well, the train didn't come to Tombstone until <laughs> 1907, so that's about 30 years off. And so she just kept going on and on mm. like that. And finally she says, do you want to know why I know so much? I and mean, we all kind of stifled a laugh and said, yes, we do. And she said, I married a local. Oh, no. good. That was the answer. <laughs> and, and that was the answer. And wait, wait, do, they, do they know you in Tombstone? No, no. Oh, they hate me in Tombstone. Why? I, oh, God. I, I just, oh. One time I was there filming for the Western Channel. And we had just run an article about how Tombstone perhaps was going to lose its historic uh, designation. And we were just presenting, you know, both sides of it and saying, guys, you need to wake up and stop painting buildings purple. That was what we were basically saying. And so I'm on the street and get her into film at six o'clock in the morning and the mayor comes down the street, they're putting sand on the, on the street and I'm sitting there getting ready for my take and he walks by and recognizes me and without even just pausing, he says, Tell the truth! <laughs> I went, okay. All right. <laughs> okay. All right. That is fantastic. I wasn't going to. I would, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for now that you that. said yeah. that. Uh, now, as a hip historian, I'm guessing your more recent vintage is uh, more of your concern. Um, the stuff that these guys are talking about, the, from feuds to, to the OK Corral, does it seep into what you're involved um, with? I really look at Arizona once the car gets here. That's when I think a lot of fun start happening. People start traveling around, people start moving and having different experiences. And so that's when you really had this other explosion of then Phoenix. And when you look at like the 30s, that boon of Phoenix. When, so when you, when you present in front of folks and you, and you would do whatever you do to present history, 
how do you compartmentalize it? Do you go by decades? Do you start with the car and move forward? I mean, um, basically, just in my own mind, I kind of start with the car and move forward. Um, but really, it's more story based what I'm doing. So a lot of times, because what's great is a lot of stuff I'm talking about, there are some people around who remember it. Yeah. And so I can actually sit down and talk to somebody who went through it and then use what they've told me, use my skills as a librarian to find out more information and piece that together as well. So, and as well as verify, because, you know, sometimes people's memories are a little... <laughs> yeah, like, like the lady in Tombstone. Yeah. yeah. Right. Uh, Marshall, you are Arizona, the Arizona official mm -hmm. historian. What's that mean? Well, um, <laughs> it means I've been working pro bono for about 19 years now uh, for the state, uh, on call at all time. No, it means a lot. And what means most is that it was a, it was a group of fourth grade teachers who uh, went to the governor uh, in 1990, I think 1995, and uh, began to uh, uh, lobby, I guess. I told them, got, uh, good luck with it, but um, they lobbied and uh, it came uh, then one day I got a call from the governor's office. But, so I've been doing it ever since through uh, reappointed by all the governors. So much of your presentation involves singing, at least it yeah. has in the past. Um, does that connect you in different ways in, it, in otherwise writing or storytelling or those sorts of things? Yeah, when I walk into a classroom of uh, fourth graders, I visit a lot of schools. If I go in there just like this, I, I'm just another old geezer. But I go in there with a guitar strapped on and they say, hey, there's something going to happen here. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, the guitar has helped me a lot. I use it. I still use it. And uh, uh, Bob and I work at Cartwright, so in the Arizona History Series out there. And let there me say that nobody uh, does Beyonce. Like him. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It's going, you go, yeah, sure. Dead on. Yeah. You, you, you turn away and you go, that's Beyonce. Well, <laughs> but, but it, when you sing, when you sing as opposed to speak, or right. I just wonder, does, does it envelop, is, is, do you see history in a different way? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, uh, the thing I always liked about folk music was it has a story to tell, and I love the stories and the songs, a lot of, most of the songs I do, um, written by local songwriters, and uh, they, they tell an Arizona story. So that, uh, that, really, that really makes me, uh, I get into the story and then I have a song, and it just sort of, it breaks up a lecture. Yeah. I guess that's what <laughs> that's it does. That's a good way to put it. And you draw. Yes. You illustrate history. Again, when you're sitting there in front of the th do you, do, are, are, do you find yourself kind of, are you there? Are you there? Well, it can channel. I think, I don't know if you guys have this, but uh, uh, when I'm drawing, uh, you kind of get in the zone. And when you're in the zone and if you're trying to capture that feeling, sometimes you can just kind of levitate uh, into that place. And, and you can kind of feel what it was like. So uh, yeah, that, that, it, yeah, it's got to be different than just talking or writing. Yeah. I mean, yeah. when you're drawing them, I and you're, you're kind of deciding what they look like. Don't yes, you? Yeah. yes, and that's hard because so much of our, our image of that time is from the movies. Yeah, and so it's really hard to kind of shut that off because you don't want that because that's that's what everybody tends to go to, and the real old West was much different than uh, with the way Hollywood portrays it. Example, uh, in, in Tombstone, they had. Uh, wine bars and they had uh, coffee shops, they had four coffee shops, they had ice cream parlors and 26 imported wines from Europe. They had uh, imported oysters that were brought in. Uh, it was very, very Cosmo, uh, but you don't see that in the movies. It was a wealthy town, they could afford <laughs> yeah. it and they did. And they, they had telephones that connected the mines to the, to the Tombstone Stock mm. Exchange. My goodness. Yeah. yeah, no, you never see that. No, you don't. No. And so, you, so when you're drawing, you don't, you don't want to draw Miss Kitty in the Long Branch. I mean, that's, that's just a no-no. And so you want to go see what it really looked like, and then, so then you end up in the library or at the Historical Society trying to find the real photos. When you talk about Phoenix, a latter-day Phoenix, if you will, uh, do you have to, how do you get involved, knowing that a lot of the people you're talking to they know what they know what you're talking about. They were here. They have their relatives were here. I mean, how do you get? How do you? How do you present that kind of information? Well, a lot of times, what I'll do is, if there's variants of a story, I will actually say that there's there's this story, and then there's also this additional piece from someone else, and this piece from someone else, so that it really kind of becomes part of that culture, of that story. That it's not just there's not just one true. Here's exactly what happened. And it's interesting though because we're talking OK Corral, we're talking feuds up at uh, you know uh, south and east of the 260 now. Pleasant um, Valley. Yeah, yeah, Pleasant Valley. Um, but latter day history. I mean, you got Don Bowles, you've got Bob Crane, you've got you know even Winnie Ruth Dredge, not all that latter. But right. when when they're closer, they just don't seem quite as 
palatable. Well, and I and I mean, and there are things that I don't touch on, um, like the murders at the Buddhist temple. I that's still too recent and too severe, and I don't haven't found any angle of that that's actually inner any element of entertainment. Um, but even like when you talk about Keith Haring's mural that used to be on Central and Adams, it's like I have people who told me I saw it torn down when the building was torn down. Yeah. And no, we know that's not the case. Yeah. And so there's and so that's part of it is everyone thinks they saw something. Yeah. And that's not really what happened. But it's just part of that story. And just add, kind of adds to that whole mystery and allure of here's what happened and here's kind of what we think happened, but we really don't know. Speaking of stories, uh, we got you guys here. Let, let's start telling some stories here around the campfire. G All give, right. me, give us a story that you think uh, represents Arizona. Just one you like to tell. Oh, right. Well, uh, oh, there I got a million of them. But <laughs> I'll bet you one do. That, uh, one of my favorite tombstone stories is I was down there on a film shoot, and um, I was standing on the corner uh, just waiting around for them to get ready again, and a fellow walks up to me. Uh, he's got his family with him, and he says, um, uh, say, uh, do you know anything about this place? And I said, a little bit. And he said, um, well, the gunfights don't start again for 45 minutes. What can I do to entertain my family uh, before the next gunfight? And I said, there's a great underground mining tour here, and it's really, really educational. And uh, he looked at me like, and then he said, uh, they had mining here? <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> I felt like saying, no, they just had a gunfight every morning. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. Everything revolved yeah. around the gunfight. Give us a story. You know, I'm, uh, uh, I'm investigating the Huam payroll robbery. Yeah. And, I want, and I'm a firm believer that you have to go out to the site and you have to walk where they walk. I just, that's just one of my things. I have to do that. So I got a topo map. I talked to a couple of historians. I might even have talked to you, Marshall. And I went out there. And it's out by uh, Pima, Arizona, which is next to Thatcher, which is next to Safford. Okay. okay and I drove up in the mountains and I got up there. And then the, Pam, uh, the Wham payroll robbery uh, happened because the Army was delivering the payroll from Fort Grant over the mountainside of Mount Graham over to Fort Thomas to pay the soldiers there. And so, I don't know if you've been down there uh, lately, but there's just a, a Circle K uh, there, okay? A, a little bit of a Circle K. And mm -hmm. so I'm up there, and uh, I go, and I see, and th th there's still the forts that they built for the, the, the bad guys who were in the government at Pima, Arizona. <laughs> and so they were robbing the payroll so that they could uh, land a government job at the, at the fort that they were robbing. So it's so Arizona. Oh, <laughs> and, yeah. And they got, they got away with it, okay. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so anyway, so I'm up there, and I'm looking. The forts are still there. And so I'm coming. All of a sudden, I look down, and there's a, there's a cowboy pickup next to mine. And I go, uh-oh, I, I hate this. You know, he's wondering why I'm here, and I'm traipsing around, getting you know, excited. So I run down there. And I say, um, I'm trying to establish myself. And I said, I'm from True West Magazine. I'm doing a story on the Wham payroll robber. And he goes, oh, yeah, I, I've heard of that my whole life. Don't know much about it. What was that about? And I said, well, it was because of the, uh, they, were, they robbed the payroll going to, to Fort Thomas to pay the soldiers. And he looks at me and he says, he'd lived here 70 years. And he goes, there was a fort at Fort Thomas? <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. But we, and we got two stories here of yeah. general ignorance well, of what's going on. Right. It's 80%. 80% yeah. don't care. They've lived there their whole life and they don't want to know. And you better not, you, if you're going to tell them the truth, you better make them laugh. Otherwise, they'll kill you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, give, give us a story here. So one day I'm at a thrift store going through albums. And I find Knockers Up by Rusty Warren recorded live at the Pomp Room in Phoenix, Arizona. Ris risque for, Indeed. for Phoenix, Arizona. Indeed. I saw that show. <laughs> so I was like, okay, so of course I bought it, ran home and started researching and found Rusty Warren's website. So it said, contact me, so I did. And so we started developing this friendship of actually talking on the phone. Um, she actually is in, so she was a comedian here in the 50s and 60s. Mm -hmm. And she hit it big in the early 60s with a song called Knockers Up. Mm -hmm. She was renting in the Central Phoenix. When that song hit, she then moved to Paradise Valley and is what she calls it, the house that Knockers built. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and she's very much abroad uh, in that great sense of the term. And she's in Palm Springs right now, writing her paperwork for the Library of Congress being billed as the mother of the sexual revolution for that song. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, and so, and that happened right here in Phoenix. 
And that's just one piece of Americana that Arizona has given to the rest of the country that nobody knows about. Well, and, and a lot, I mean, a lot of music, art has happened oh, here. I mean, everything yeah. from Wayne Newton to Dwayne Eddy yeah, to yeah. the Meat Puppets to all right. points in between. Waylon Jennings. Waylon yeah. Jennings. Jackson I mean, Pollock. Uh, yeah, exactly. Talk, yeah, excuse me. Talk about Jackson Pollock. I don't know if I don't, can. Yeah, but he went to school here. Yeah, yeah, he, right, he, he went he to school was, here. Yeah, he was a grammar school not far from uh, where we sit. And uh, of course, uh, and I think that that whether you're here for a short time or a long time, the impact of being here, whether you hated it or loved it, it gets in your blood and it comes out through art and mm -hmm. music. Mm -hmm. So and Alice and, Cooper, exactly. And yeah. so again, there is that little offbeat feel to it, isn't yes. there? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. It was on the cutting edge in the '50s of with Lee Hazelwood and people like that in, in the uh, at Ramsey Studio right over here. Yep. Uh, and uh, Jim Miller was recording all those. And it was on the cutting edge of, of, of a whole new, they call it the Phoenix Sound. Yeah. And Jim West is working on a book on that now, on the Phoenix Sound. But it was kind of a hillbilly, but it was our own unique. Yeah. Uh, ended up. Mm -hmm. we well, you know, they uh, wanted a thick guitar sound for Dwayne Eddy, for Rebel Rouser and these big hits that conquered the world. I mean, you go, you go to Europe and Dwayne Eddy's the, like the biggest thing going. And they wanted a big guitar sound and they couldn't get it out of the amps. So they went down into the river bottom and they found a, 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 a water tank, a big old water tank. And they... It was empty, and they put a microphone down in there, and then played the guitar through that, and <laughs> bow, bow, bow. Yeah, and that's, that's where funny. that comes yeah. from, from the Salt River. Yep. Uh, and these guys were thinking out of the box, man. Yeah. yeah. And not only, okay, they were thinking out of the box. Twenty, thirty, fifty, seventy years from now, will they look back on this era of Arizona history and say innovation, thinking out of the box? I hope they think we, there were some strange characters uh, uh, like Bob Bowles Bell, people like that, uh, that were here at that time that really made a difference. <laughs> but but it, it does make a difference, though, when the state is young and growing to mm -hmm. where it kind of reads a little bit of a stride. It's harder. It becomes more homogenized, yeah. I'd say, uh, that unique character. Something gets lost, and that's why I love the small towns, because a lot of those characters are still out there, or, or at least they stand out a whole lot better in those smaller towns, Springerville, places like that. And, do, you, do you think historians of the future will look back on this era and say, well, what will they say? What do you think they'll say? Well, I think it's like you've got a lot of things like Roosevelt, um, right just up the street here, which in the last few months has gone through a drastic change. So you now see a lot of young people who before just used it as a way to get to and from class. But now they're like going, well, wait a minute, it's drastically changing. It's like they're losing, it's losing the character that I know and love. Mm -hmm. And so they're now starting to get active in helping preserve that history that they're not necessarily aware of, but they just kind of feel. I guess change is history, isn't it, Bob? I mean, that's Yeah, uh, nothing changes more than the past. And I will say, I'll make a prediction right here on your show, and that is that there will be very famous people from our era, but it won't be who we think it is. Mm. When the people came back to Tombstone and, and found out that Wyatt Earp and Doc Holliday were the ones to be remembered when they thought it was going to be Richard Gerd and, mm -hmm. and John mm. Clum and all the people who uh, were of society, they were shocked. They were, they were just like, you're telling me that these, these bums who, were, who came down here and had a fight in an alley are the mm. famous ones? So I tell you what, look at the police bother. <laughs> look, look at, look at the, the, the people that you, that, that you hate, that you think are ruining Arizona. They're going to be remembered. That's why Marshall's at the top of the list. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Uh, We've got, we got a few minutes left here. If you could live in the past, any of Arizona's past, any era, what would it be? I, uh, I was writing a book about that uh, 20th century Arizona, and I really would have loved to have been a, a young man about the time of my grandfather, around 1900. Um, I think uh, the trains, we had trains then, you could get places a lot easier, and it was, um, uh, the wars were over, and um, it just seemed like a fun, uh, a fun time, right up, into the, right up into the roaring 20s. But the trouble is, is if you lived that, uh, then you would have had to deal with the 30s and World War II. <laughs> That's true. That's true. But, but there was a spot in Arizona's past that you could just go back to with you know, the Star Trek transponder or whatever it is. What would it be? I would really do that post-war, War II boom. I mean, that, that gave us, I mean, the, the first McDonald's that gave us Bob's Big Boy, that gave us Bill Johnson's Big Apple. I mean, that gave us so much of the flavor. I mean, gave us these amazing neon signs yeah. that when you drive down Camelback, what's the one thing everybody remembers? Courtesy Chevrolet. Yeah. That, that big, flashy sign. Bob? 
You know, I would, I'm tempted to say the Old West, but, uh, but there's no air conditioning. And, and it's, it, yeah. it, it, it would be, this is a, I remember growing up when there was, uh, there was not AC, it was just air pad coolers, and the air pad coolers could not keep up. Mm. And they were just in some houses, okay? And then the cars, there was none in cars. There was none in cars. And we used to sell these window coolers that you'd put on, and uh, they had a little fan in it, and you'd pour ice in the top, and then it would blow cool air in, in there. And uh, we were on our way to a vacation, and my dad said, let's try that. And so it was great until we went to a curve, and the water came in on my mom's head, and we never used it again. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll tried tell you what. I to a drive-in movie with a girl uh, in, in the 1950s with no air conditioning, and yeah. talk about hot weather sticking together. Yeah. All right, gentlemen, we will all stop. Holy mackerel. Don't stop. I, I was yeah. going to say, no, we got to stop there. Time says, oh, you're historians. You know all about time. We're yes. out of it. Uh, thank you all for joining us. We do appreciate thank it. Thank you very much. Thank you. And that is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great evening.